So there's been a lot of uh, serious uh, stuff talked about this afternoon, and I'll, I'll probably at some risk to my reputation, I'll, I'll share this incredibly goofy idea I had to start this off, which was I was going to arrive with a, with a package and hold it here for a couple of, of seconds and say, TEDx? I thought you said FedEx. <laughs> but, <coughs> but I won't do that because we're talking about serious stuff. Uh, so I'll, I'll get back to the, to, the, to the subject at hand, which of course is creating uh, a full citizenry. And, and I guess that's uh, very appropriate that we'd be doing that in a, uh, in a college, um, in a place of higher learning, a place of post-secondary education, because that's, uh, in a sense, uh, a huge part of our mission. I think to start off in this section with uh, Alex Nee was really a, important because it reminds us of how much work we have to do around the world. But I think to be, I think to be fair and, and, and relatively speaking, as I think always a dangerous phrase to use when you're speaking of human rights, but, but relatively speaking, we're, we're of course in a different place in Canada. And whereas our, our, you know, our, our sense of, of, of citizenship is not under siege uh, or or in some ways not as yet realized as it is, and of course, so many other places there are in the world. So we, so we start with some very important caveats um, at, at a different place. But we also recognize there are cracks, and that's really why this is an important subject that's engaging us this afternoon and today, because, because we're not yet there yet. And there are lots of ways of measuring citizenship, and, and I don't think any of them are um, completely beyond debate, certainly not, uh, not, not that I've seen. I was struck when I was doing some work in, in researching uh, how technology would affect government and, and the delivery of public service and democracy and the, the practice of politics. Uh, there was a, an American uh, political scientist named Robert Putnam who wrote a very powerful article at the time in the mid-90s called Bowling Alone. And it was very powerful partly because it's a great title um, and it was what he, his, his study was was essentially positing that, that a lot of the community kind of ties that, that, uh, that bound people in the United States, because that's where his study was, were fraying. And, and the, the title comes from the fact that he found that as many people as ever in the United States were bowling, but the number of bowling leagues had diminished. And it was really expressing, as to some extent uh, other studies had done, if you go back to elements of Neil Postman's work, or even go back all the way back to the Middletown, uh, studies back in the 20s and, and looking at the way societies were, 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 were held together and bound, what the glue was. Um, you'd seen elements of this. But he was really saying we've got some trouble in the United States. He became a bit of a rock star for a while, went and saw President Clinton and got into uh, People magazine and so on. But I, th I thought it was very, uh, he had a very powerful concept, which I think is, is relevant here, which he, he said there are, because uh, he's talked about the notion of social capital, which really in, in a sense, kind of holds a society together. And, and if you can measure that, you really could measure the strength of a society. And he had two notions of it. One was of, of a bonding capital, which really talked to the strength of kind of, if you can think of it as siloed communities. And then bridging capital, which was the kind of capital that could actually work across communities. And of course, he said, if you had one but not the other, uh, your society really wasn't as strong as it, as it should be. Well, there's a simple measure I look at for the strength of, of citizenship and, and the attachment, the engagement of people. And it perhaps reflects some of the time I spent in public service and politics. I look at, at turnout at uh, elections. You can argue that, that you know, is that, is that a relevant one? Maybe politics is becoming more uh, uh, irrelevant uh, than it ever has been in the past. But I think when organizations like Amnesty International are doing the important work and human rights organizations around the work, world are doing the important work that they do and we see the struggle for democracy everywhere. To take this flippantly um, and to, to dismiss it as a, as a waste of time uh, really kind of misses the point. And I think the, the, the folks who, who the, the, the more you hear that, the more I think you could understand that our, our, we're not that quite there as, uh, with a full citizenry. What's disturbing to me is that you have to go back 20 years, two decades, to find a federal election where the voter turnout was over 70%. It's steadily diminished to, to uh, somewhere below, uh, below 65 now on a steady basis, flirting, in fact, with going below 60. Even worse, in our own provincial election here in Ontario, in the last provincial election, was less than 50%. <laughs> one, in, one, one in two people didn't, didn't find it worthwhile to go out and vote. Um, and if you think that's not important, uh, I, would, I would just say to you, do you think it doesn't matter, and I'm not being partisan, but do you think it doesn't matter whether we have a minority or a majority government in Ontario, or, or in fact in Ottawa? Or do you think the choices for mayor in Toronto in the recent election were irrelevant? 
I don't think they were, and I don't think the results are, uh, are, are anything that we should take lightly as citizens, let alone if you're partisans. Now, you take that kind of statistics, and then I looked at another one, which is extremely disturbing, which is the, the trend of income inequality in, in uh, Canada, but particularly in, in Toronto and this region. In fact, if you look at the big cities in Canada, Toronto is by far the, has the, fir the worst uh, level of income inequality. So yes, the rich are getting richer. You may have thought that, but it's absolutely true. Um, and in a place like Toronto, and increasingly, um, just talking yesterday to a mayor in the 905 area, talking about the difficulty of attracting uh, working people to uh, his community because of the price of housing. So we're seeing stresses in our society that I don't think we can possibly ignore. Now, coming to a, a place of higher education, one of the things I think that we do brilliantly, um, and it's just because of who we are, not necessarily even how we execute it, but we're still places where I think, actually, I don't think there's, an, there's another one in our society today where, where the diversity gathers uh, for meaningful activity in such a way. I mean, think about it. I mean, you know, riding the subway, uh, going up an a, you know, elevator in an office tower isn't quite the same as coming to school and studying with people and, and, and working with them in collaborative groups as, as, as our students do. And, and anyone who comes to Seneca College knows the diversity of our students. And that's partly why, why for me, it's, it's, it's so important that this remain a place and not an internet address, not a, not, a, not a place you sign on to through the internet exclusively, but a place where you can come and engage and collaborate and, and, and learn about other people and not just about other things, because that too is an important part of citizenship. But I think we need to do more. And, and here, I think, in the tradition of, of uh, TED and TEDx, I'll, I'll offer a uh, a not so modest, in fact, probably a, an audacious idea. What if, we, what if we thought about taking the great experiences, and, and Laura was one of those who had the experience of Katimovic, there's World, uh, Canada World Youth, there's uh, World University Service Canada, there's all sorts of experiences. What, what if we return to the day when there was some sort of a national service? And I'm not talking military service. I'm talking about what if every young person, after high school, maybe in the first year or two of post-secondary age, what if they had to do a, a, a semester, a few months, uh, working in, in an at-risk neighborhood, if they had to work in an Aboriginal community, if they, if they could go overseas, uh, experience uh, some element of international development, um, some kind of thing that took them out of, as they say, their comfort zone, put them with a group of young Canadians, and truly from across the country, I mean, I'd have three rules. One is that everybody would have to do it. This isn't, this isn't a voluntary thing, that's the whole point. The whole point is to expose, uh, expose people to a different reality than, they, than they've grown up with. To, to not just bond, but to bridge. To build those kinds of relationships. So that would be one rule. Second rule is ideally, and I'm not in government anymore so I don't have to pay for this, um, Ideally, you take them not just out of their community, but even right, side, right out of the province. Take them to a different place, some even out of the country. That would be, that would be a, a truly different experience. And finally, there would be an explicit citizenship component to it. That's what it's all about. It would be very, it'd be, that, that's, that's, what it would, that's the foundation of it, and that's what, we would, that's what we would tell people it's about, and that's what they would experience at it. You know, one of the things that has, has struck me uh, coming here is, and I, and I guess I just, it's a huge juxtaposition with what's happening today as we're being encouraged, whether it's turning four-year degrees into, into three-year degrees or whether it's, it's governments that are looking at, askance at, uh, at uh, what's called the victory lap in high school. There's this notion that we have to speed up the process for young people to get them through as quickly as possible. And I think it's time maybe we step back a little bit and stop thinking about education as, as something you measure with a stopwatch. But in fact, as, as look back to the kind of first principles of what are we trying to expose uh, young people to and, and what is it that they're looking for? And of course, anyone in post-secondary education today knows that, uh, relatively speaking, so few students now take a straight line. So few students decide in you know, grade 10 or 11, what they're going to be, come to college or university, get their two, three, four year credential, 
and then go out and do it for the rest of their lives. That just isn't how it happens. Uh, it, it, in so few cases is that the, the path of reality. Now we're seeing, we're seeing this journey, and it's a wonderful journey for students to take of exploration. It can be an expensive one, unfortunately. Uh, it, can be, it can be too long because of some of the rules that we unfortunately put, some of the obstacles we put in their place to go from one place to another. But it really reflects that as young people look for their passion, as anyone looks for their passion, it sometimes, sometimes takes time. And perhaps we're in this, in this rush to get them through as quickly as possible into the workforce. Um, we're, we're cutting corners. And so if they were able to take some time in an at-risk neighborhood in Montreal or an Aboriginal community in northern Manitoba or a, a small village in Burkina Faso uh, for a few months, um, uh, I don't think that would be such a bad thing. And I don't think it would be such a bad thing for them to pause, not only in the sense of, of really uh, appreciating that, that, that broader sense of the world, as, as Alex put it, that global citizenship, but, but also perhaps some time to reflect on, on where they were going. And if along the way they were to really fully appreciate the understanding and understand you know, what it was to be engaged in, in, in a community, or if they were to understand what it was like to, to bridge the divide and, and in a diverse world build relationships across those diversities, or if they were to fully come to appreciate how precious and how important full citizenship is, well, I just don't think that would be such a bad thing. I think, in fact, that would be time well spent. Thanks very much. <laughs>